of the head on. Um, hang on. Is the sound okay? How are we doing on sound? Okay, very good. Um, Has everyone signed the attendance? How we do? One, two, three, four, five, six, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Uh, where we left off um, was with the realization that um, Let, let, let me see how to say this. Um, a lot of the study of chaos has been based on nonlinear differential equations. And I think there's a kind of an assumption here that all things, or all data, is like this. That is, it has those mathematical properties. And what we're finding out is that that's not the case. That data has sometimes different properties. And so in developing the analysis, But now I'm going to laugh because I'm not wearing the hat, so it's like hopeless. So um, um, in some ways, it means that a lot of the math doesn't match the properties of the experimental data. And I think this is a point I've been making all along. In a way, this is good because it means that the data can be a way to drive new mathematics. But there's a danger if we have some picture of the world, which means our mathematical models or something else. And if that's not a, an exact match to what the real world is, if the real world is different than that, then we have to be careful about assuming that this thing is that, because it's not that. And I think this has happened a little bit in the uh, in the chaos business. Now, especially a lot of the physicists who have handled these things have come from a background in these equations and sometimes assume we can apply them directly to the world and sometimes the world has somewhat different properties. And I think this has been a problem in this field. And I think we're beginning to see an opening up of discussions of more widely different types or a wider picture in mathematics of things that can be applied. And as I said, I think this opens up new opportunities. Let me give you a sense at least of a couple of options or a couple of approaches that people have been using uh, in order to do this. One of the ways to get around some of the problems that happen in terms of analyzing the phase space is that if a system is random, and we look at the phase space shown here far away and shown here in large, that every time we come through the phase space, we'll come through it a different direction because it's not organized. That's what it means for an attractor, that the phase space has some overall organization. For example, as shown here. In the Lorentz system, and this is the Lorentz system, in this part of the attractor, we're always moving in the same direction. So if I enlarge this piece, into here, we see that the arrows run roughly in the same direction. And that's not true for the random system, where the direction in the attractor will be at random. What this means is if we average all these random vectors, we'll get something that doesn't point in any particular direction. So the vector is very small. So if we take, and this is called a coarse graining, because we don't want to go down to infinitely small where there are no data points at all. So we want it to be coarse enough to see some data, but not so coarse enough that it's too big. 
And in fact, this issue of, of this coarse graining occurs in many problems in chaos, and it's actually been a diff difficult one to handle in terms of entropy, and, and it is, is actually been an interesting mathematical issue in a number of different ways. Um, so for this non-chaotic uh, phase space, the average direction is small or in not in any particular direction, whereas for the Lorenz attractor, we can see that if we average all these together, we'll get a large average. So this is one way of um, trying to differentiate randomness from chaos. You can see this works very successfully for this Lorenz system versus uh, this um, stochastic random system. So far, this particular method, although it shows a lot of promise, has not been used directly um, in any um, biological system. A method that's related to this has been used. Now, I'm going to just say this very briefly. H how many people here have had Ming Zhu Ding's course? I asked this, but I forgot the answer. Have you? OK. So since you remember everything from that course, I can say this briefly to give you uh, uh, a hint. Uh, the, uh, you actually will remember enough or something in order to make sense. What happens in a chaotic system is that in some directions, which are called the stable manifold, um, we approach an attractor. That is, these surfaces are really saddles. So in some directions, we approach an attractor. We're drawn towards something. But in other directions, we're pushed away. So that's the unstable manifold. Does that sound familiar? You have a stable and unstable manifold. What, what that means practically in terms of analyzing real data, if you look at the data, you'll be here and there and here maybe and there and there. So you get closer and closer. But then once you get to the unstable part, you fly away. So rather rapidly, you get away. So the data will look in. Um, I was about to create an animation here, which I won't. Basically, as I said, we'll start here. We'll have the points here and then spread out. So this is the signature. This movement of the points together and then away, together in a way, would be the signature that we have a chaotic system. And people have used that. Uh, Frank Morse, for example, uh, who I talked to a couple of weeks ago in LA, and a few other people have used this, for example, to analyze data from the heart, um, as well as I think they may have done this with spike trains, but I'm not sure. Uh, we were thinking of using this technique for our ion channel data, although, though we did it for other technical reasons, um, because I wasn't sure that this way of representing the data for our data would be accurate or appropriate. So this, again, goes back to the heart of using the mathematics. You see from the mathematics that it has certain properties. And if we see the data go through those properties that are related to the chaos, then we can tell we've got a chaotic system. So, so this is a different method. So again, the methods that we've had for looking for chaos are just looking at the dimension of the attractor, now looking at some average property of direction in the phase space, looking at really some mathematics of what happens in terms of uh, a approaching a stable and an unstable manifold. So we can use different properties of the mathematics to analyze the data. So there's no one single thing, is we have a number of properties that I'm not really describing in detail, uh, which I can uh, do more in the course that I give in the spring, um, and which Ming Zhu Ding also gives even more rigorously in his course. So we can use these different things to analyze the data. Now, another technique that has become increasingly important, and I also want to place this in perspective too, is a technique involving surrogates. And let me talk about this both in a scientific sense and in what I'll call a political sense. In the beginning, which in this case means 1970, when people did um, the first chaos analysis was published since Poincaré in a lot of ways. People found attractors, for example, of dimension, let's say, <coughs> five, and said they had chaotic systems. And they just knew they were right. And I think there was a problem here because I think people were a little bit too dogmatic 
in how certain they were about this stuff being correct. And that's bad to me. I don't know if I've said here, but I think this arises partly because when you try to publish articles, if you say you're pretty sure about something and you present evidence for it, very often the article gets rejected because it's not right or it's not proven or something. And I think this causes people to do the opposite. It causes people, for example, when you have data that looks pretty good um, but not perfect, um, I think people then throw away the bad data just so you have the good part left. So it looks so there's going to be no problem with the reviewers for the articles. And I think that's very dangerous. Um, and in a number of the articles that found these low dimensional attractors, the data kind of looked like that. It looked really super. And in fact, the data never looks this good. This was very, very carefully chosen data, not really representative. The real data would be much more like this and there are scalings and everything was real, but this gives a false sense of how good the data was. And I think these people did it maybe partly in response to being afraid that it wouldn't look good enough, but whatever it is, there was a number of attractors were shown, particularly for biological systems, that now when people look at the data, I think would find a little less convincing. But they were presented in a way that was too convincing. And I don't think that's good. I think you need to have a, a balance in an article. And you can come to a firm conclusion, but I think people reviewing the article have to be willing to see that there's a balance and not everything is perfect. And I think a lot of reviewers are not, are not good. And that's what I mean by political. Well, suddenly, from all his results being, being just finding a low dimensional attractor, so what they showed in these articles was that the dimension was 5, which is less than infinity, and therefore it was chaotic. Suddenly, what people wanted is something stronger than this. So what these same people then did is to develop some surrogate that is, they recast the data in some form which would lose the deterministic property. And then if they did that, the dimension should be closer to infinity. And then if they did this, then everything would be OK if they saw the difference. And again, now this is the perfect way to do it. And then it, they originally had one surrogate, which would work all the time. And then there's now a different surrogate, which is always the right. And each time, they have exactly the right answer. And everything that was done before was no good. And I really dislike this attitude. I think this is a very dangerous attitude. I think every time you do something, there's got to be some give in it. And it's never that what you do is done right. And what you did last year was completely wrong. It's not like that. And I think this leads to a very biased and not a right perspective in how to handle things. The way the principle behind the surrogate is shown here, so if we have an original time series and we can generate the surrogate in different ways, I'll mention two ways. We go from the original time series to the surrogate and if the original phase space then looks exactly like the surrogate, then whatever we took out of the original um, meant that it didn't affect the analysis. So if the original was still high dimensional and this was high dimensional, and what we think we took out was determinism, then since there was no change, the original must have been determinist, was, must have been random. And let me say it in terms of this way, it will look clearer if I say it this way. If we have a time series that we think is deterministic and we take out the determinism, if it's deterministic, it'll have a low dimensional phase space. If we take that out, then it will not look deterministic. So if we see a difference between the surrogate and the original, what we took out that made them different was the determinism, and therefore the original thing was deterministic. If that wasn't the case, if what we found after we took out determinism was the same, then the original one didn't have anything that was different than what was left here, and so the original one must have not been deterministic. And I haven't said that completely well, but I think, is that, is that close enough? OK. OK, well, I think the issue of what to take out is one of the issues here. So let me show you one of what you can take out. OK, so we have here the original data. And one of the things we can do to the original data, so this is how can we form the surrogate.
one thing we can do is we can take the original data and randomize it. That is, we can take the same numbers, if they're in a time series, and shuffle them into a random order. That seems reasonable, because if, if these numbers represent some trajectory in the phase space, if we take them all and then scramble them, then we'll you know, create some sort of random trajectory in the phase space. So that seems reasonable. People did like this because of reasons which I don't find particularly convincing. But what they said is what they would like to do is to maintain first order correlations. but eliminate higher order correlations. In other words, what they would like to have is have the original data and the surrogate have the same autocorrelation function, or the sa which is equivalent to the same power spectra, but then different higher order functions. And, and there's a way of doing this. The way you do this is you make a Fourier transform of the data, you randomize the phases, and you Fourier transform back. And I said that fast enough instead of writing it down because it's not worth going through the detail of it. <coughs> this, for the moment, has become the standard surrogate. So what you would do is you would do the analysis on the data and on this particular surrogate and then see whether they're the same or they're different. Now, why the idea was that this randomizing mixes up things too much, and this mixes up things a little bit. And then you can tell whether the higher order properties. But maybe this doesn't mix things up. This still mixes things up too much. And in fact, uh, there was only one article about this. So maybe the article was correct, maybe it wasn't. But there was an article from a guy in India about a, a year ago in Physical Review that basically said that this surrogate by maintaining the first order correlations was actually not a good surrogate. The issue here, let me say what the issue is. This has been complicated and it's been confusing within the field. So it's, I mean, I may say it well or good, whatever is the correct word, or it may not now. Let me see if I can try. The issue has been involving signals which are called colored noise. What, what does colored noise mean? Well, noise that wouldn't be co colored is called white noise. So white noise is a power spectra where there are equal components of all frequencies. And this is called white because white light is the sum of all different frequencies of light. So colored noise means that it's not equal amounts of all different frequencies, but if we look at the power as a function of frequency, on a log-log plot, typically it looks something like this. So the power of colored noise depends on the frequency raised to the minus alpha. This is called, also called 1 over f noise, even if alpha is not equal to 1. Now it turned out that the methods that found low-dimensional attractors would also find low-dimensional attractors for 1 over f noise, even if the noise was random. It is if the noise was created in a way so there was no determinism, the methods would still find a low dimensional attractor. And these surrogate methods were, were developed so that these methods would not be fooled by the colored noise. Okay. Now, the issue here is complicated or subtle is maybe a, a more accurate word. In that, what do we mean by determinism? If we take white noise, and we put it through a filter, it will then make colored noise. But a filter is a deterministic system. So in a certain sense, this white, this colored noise is deterministic. And it's not that the methods have given us the wrong result. They've really told us something that we wanted. And the question is, we have to be very careful in exactly the question we ask. Colored noise has some aspects which are deterministic and some aspects which are not. We've got to be very careful in, in clarifying the questions that we ask. Okay? So um, 
this analysis, in some sense, the chaos analysis, fails to differentiate colored noise from a deterministic process, but in some sense, that's okay because we think colored noise is, in some sense, partially deterministic. So I've actually said that okay. I haven't written down the words that correspond to it, but maybe I should quit well in my head since I said the words correctly. Okay, is that, at least the idea behind this, I think, is clear. And, and, and at the moment, there's a debate in the field with how to handle the surrogates and, and what an appropriate surrogate is, but then there's also an issue, and some of the things we're trying to differentiate out are things we shouldn't be differentiating out, that they real, really do have a deterministic uh, component to them. So in, in summary, I think when we have a time series and we generate a phase space, if all we do is the dimension, that can tell us whether the system is random or deterministic. Because if the dimension is low, we know it's deterministic. And if the dimension is high, then we know it's random. And this is what people have done for the electrocardiogram or the electroencephalogram. But I think because of all the problems in doing just the dimension, we have a much stronger case if we can vary a parameter and then see the behavior predicted by the model that we're expecting. The disadvantage of this is a lot of times we don't have a model, so we can't do this. Okay? But if we can do this, then, and we see the behavior vary with a change in parameter, I think this is a stronger approach because the system is serving as its own control. As we vary the parameter, we don't have to pick up the dimension from nowhere, but we see the system go through its paces as it changes. And to me, that's stronger. But we don't always have this. We may not have a model, and so we're stuck just looking at the dimensionality of the phase space. Now, I want to discuss some issues on the biological implications of all this. The first issue is control of a chaotic system. In the first sense, it seems crazy to biology to get into chaos. Everything we think about biology is that it's organized, is that doing something purposeful, it's doing something to control itself. So why would it produce something that varies chaotically? Okay, and one of the issues in this, somewhat counter-intuitional, some, I think it was a philosopher I knew, or took a course with, um, I read about in the New York Times. Um, um, Two thirds of which are true. Um, <coughs> made the point that the, the universe is very often not irrational, but counter intuitional. And I think one of the reasons we do experiments and learn about new things is we can be surprised on how things really are. And it changes our intuition. So our, in, our intuition would have been, intuition, would have been that the chaos is really stupid for living things. Stupid. I'm looking for green to write living things in, but there's no green. Um, but that's not true. What we, surprisingly, is that chaos allows actually better control of things. And so it might be something that biological systems are really interested in using or really have taken advantage of. And that's shown here. Here we have symbolically an analog form. Illustrated, we have a system with some control parameter. And if this is a non-chaotic system, a mostly linear system, and if this is the system output, when we change the uh, control parameter a little bit, the system changes a little. And if we change the control parameter a lot, then we need to do that, change the control parameter a lot, in order to change the system a lot. So we can control the system, but if we want to control it, we really got to bang on it hard. If the system is chaotic, and we have sensitivity to initial conditions, and we have bifurcations, then when the system, in order to change the system output, we may only need to change the system input a little bit to cause a dramatic change in the output. What this means is that we can control 
chaotic systems finer with less energy with smaller changes in the parameters <coughs> and faster than linear systems. So that chaos, this nonlinearity, the sensitivity which leads to the unpredictability, also allows us to make the system more controllable. And this may be of real biological advantage. So at first thought, although it looks like all these things would mess up what biological systems do, it's possible that biological systems could take advantage of this to produce much better control in terms of things. And let me give some very specific examples of this. This is the light output produced by a laser, which is, again is light <coughs> amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. I'm tempted to say a few things about lasers. Should I say something about lasers? Yes, OK. Um, uh, the concept of lasers, or uh, one of the essential concepts, goes back to a guy whose name we've mentioned a couple of times, actually, in this course, um, who is a physicist. So if you had one guess on which physicist was involved in this, what would your one guess be? Right. So this is basically. Einstein realized that atoms give off light. This is an atom. So it's bigger than life size. And atoms give off light. So light comes out of the atoms. And atoms also, as you know, have these funny quantum states. So they, don't, they can't have any energy. They can only have discrete values of energy. And when they move from one energy level to another, light comes off, which is exactly equal to the energy difference between the two states. Now, one of the things that Einstein realized or showed was that not only if you wait long enough, oh, it's shown this is kind of a random. So if you wait on uh, the atom, the and then slide. When four atoms in here, light comes out of the similar to four. So what is that this little thing that you indicated by they're called the how do things up to the energy of the bottom, right? I mean, three atoms, if they were lowest energy states, as you heat them up, they kind of rise in energy because there's more temperature around. So this is hot. Ah, blue we do have, cold. All right. Well, if we want these to fall down and then give off light, what we have to do is we have to raise the atoms into a higher energy level. Now, normally, things are in a lower energy level. But we can create, so if we look at two energies, if this is the number in this energy, which I'll call high energy, number in the energy that's low, normally the number in the high energy will be less than the number in the low energy. Okay. And in fact, the ratio of the number in the high energy to the number in the low energy is equal to a factor that depends on the energy difference divided by the temperature. And this is a factor called the Boltzmann factor. To give you the direction I'm leading, I'm leading up to supermarkets. It's actually where I'm trying to get with this. Supermarkets. Supermarkets. Supermodels? Ma markets. Supermarkets. <laughs> so that's where I'm trying to go, so we don't lose track of, <laughs> of the direction that I'm trying to take this in. OK. So what we can do, if we want 
the light to come in and produce more light from these atoms which are in a high energy state, what we have to do, if this is the high energy and the low energy, somehow we have to move a lot of atoms from the low energy state into the high energy state. This is called the population inversion. If we have a lot of the atoms in this high energy state, when light starts to come by, we'll get light output and the light will grow because each one in turn will emit more, more light as more comes by it. So what's actually done in a laser is some mechanism, which can be electricity or voltage, for uh, the lasers that are used to shape the cornea so you don't have to wear glasses anymore. It's a chemical reaction. Those are called excimer lasers, which is an abbreviation for excited dimer. So some energy is input into the system, either chemical or electrical, to force the atoms into a higher energy level so when the light comes by, they release more light. Now, typically, you then put a mirror on both sides of this. So you put two mirrors. And so the light bounces back and forth. And as it bounces back and forth, it keeps amplifying itself. And that's what laser means. So it means light amplification by stimulated emission, which is that Einstein property of radiation. Now, these mirrors aren't perfect, so every once in a while as it's bouncing forth, it shoots out, and that's how the laser works. Okay. And um, the lasers that they have in the supermarket checkout counter, uh, which are usually made by Spectra Physics or, I forget the other major company that makes them, uh, those are those little things that scan the universal product code, okay? And there's like a laser underneath there that actually goes through a hologram. Okay, so, so the way that thing works, have I ever described this? this is, okay, the, the way that thing works is, um, it, this actually comes from the technology for heads-up displays. We're getting further and further away, but I'll get back. Uh, heads-up displays on, on military aircraft. So it's like, and they'll have these on cars. They're starting to have these on cars. So it's like a military aircraft, if you see like these Gulf War pictures, they have all these displays which are projected by a hologram in front of the windshield. And they're now doing these on cars so you could project a speedometer onto the windshield so you don't have to look down on the dash. The way that's done is there's a hologram. The laser goes through the hologram, which creates an image of what you're trying to do on the windshield. And what the scanners have is an image that's created by a hologram. So if this is a picture of the scanner, the image is actually a bowl. It's a three-dimensional bowl. And the, image, and the laser is scanned up and down and around the bowl. So it actually forms a grid pattern. So as that is scanned around, there's a sensor that detects the light output from that. And in fact, so when you hold something over the, the scanner, if this is the UPC, they don't always have to hold it down facing the scanner. You can actually, on the milk cotton, if it's up, it's reaching around the side, and as it moves through the bowl, it gets detected. Okay, so, so this process is used to produce the light, and then it goes through uh, a solid little hologram that projects it to a three-dimensional structure to do the scanning. So it's funny, because every time I think of this, I think of Albert Einstein. And the, the time between when Albert did this and these scanners is about 50 years, maybe a little longer. So we, we're sort of, we don't fund technology sometimes because we don't see what the applications are. And in this case, it was the most abstract thing that Einstein did with the stimulated emission that led to lasers in the 50s that led to the scanning device. So the scanning device is directly derived in principle from what Albert did. So it really sort of amazes me. And that shows the connections of things and how long term um, those things are. The reason why I'm saying all this this process by which the stimulated emission arises depends on a number of things. It depends on how the stimulation creates the light, how it bounces back and forth between these mirrors, what the temperature in this system is, the chemical or electrical energy that's boosting this up to here. In this laser, I actually think sometimes it's light energy from a, an incoherent light source is used to boost this up. In any case, it turns out that there are equations that describe the variability of the light, light output of the laser. 
and how they depend on the parameters of the energy input into the laser and the amplification process in the laser. Okay. And it turns out, surprisingly enough, these equations are almost exactly identical to the equations for the Lorentz system. And what that means is that the output of the laser, which I can call intensity as a function of time, actually varies for some lasers in a cha uh, chaotic way. And shown over here is actually the output of a laser. So this is real experimental data. And this is the intensity, the light output of the laser is a function of time. And it actually varies in a very irregular way. Now it's possible to use the control of chaos methods to control the output of this laser. And again, these methods are based partly on understanding the phase space. In this case, they're partly based on understanding the physics of the system. And they predict how you should vary the voltage or some parameter in the laser to change the light output. And in fact, that was done here. And this is a control parameter in driving the laser. And now you can see they made the laser vary in a very periodic way. So this shows they can actually use this to control the laser. And they can do cleverer things, too. Here, instead of just doing a simple period, you can see this is reproducing itself. Uh, it's hard to quite see it here. But they can actually make the, uh, let me, since this doesn't look right, let me get rid of it as soon as possible. Um, but they can control. This is another example. Um, this is an example of a material called a magnetoelastic ribbon. See, it even says it here. And what it looks like is a recording tape. Like in the old days when you had reel-to-reel -reel recorders, lots of people know what tape looks like. Today you have to break one of those things and open it up to see what's, uh, what's inside. But uh, you see that every once in a while, usually in parking lots where some cars run, run one of those over. Um, so this looks like that, except this was developed by the Navy to do something probably sinister. Um, and it doesn't quite have the same property as that ribbon does. It has the property that when put in a magnetic field, it gets stiff. So it changes its properties. If you put it in a mechanical properties, if you put it in between two electromagnets um, here, and the field becomes over a certain value, it becomes stiff. And in this experiment, what they did is they put it in between two electromagnets, varied the magnetic field in a periodic way, and measured the distance uh, using light uh, of distance of the ribbon from this sensor. And they've plotted it here exactly the way we did the plot, or, or the Germans did the plot, or some Germans did the plot of the uh, glycolysis. So they looked at a certain phase in the magnetic field what the position from the sensor was. And um, here, this is that plot. So this is in a chaotic regime. This is the, the different time they're recording it. This is the position from the sensor. And you can see it's all over the place. But here, using this control of chaos methods, they turned on the control. And you can see here it's always at the same place each time. Okay? So at the same point in the cycle, it's in the same place. So it's really moving in a periodic way. And so they can control the motion of this magnetoelastic ribbon by using the control of chaos techniques. The idea behind this is that the way we're used to controlling things, for example, in the heart, when the whole heart is beating irregularly, because instead of beating as a unified whole, each piece is beating separately, what we do is put a huge voltage across the heart and current. And that will depolarize all the cells at once. And then we hope that when they start together, they'll start in some unified pattern. This is a huge current. It's like when you're doing this, right, you've got to be careful not to zap and hurt the person who's actually doing this. And, you know, there's a, um, uh, uh, it's a lot of voltage and a lot of current. It's very dangerous. I've never seen this done in front of me. I've just seen this on TV. So, um, um, but I can, I've seen the panels. It's a lot of current comes through that. Um, so this is not really a cool thing to do because it's, it's really brute forcing it. So maybe a more clever thing to do would be to control the heart by using cleverly timed, much smaller pulses. And a number of people in the chaos field and, uh, I know for sure the company that makes the largest number of pacemakers um, has been interested in seeing whether you could use these methods to control the heart. And nobody knows whether this is going to work yet or not yet. 
And the idea would be to have a small number of, of electrodes on the heart, each of which are producing a small voltage, but from the control of chaos methods, you would know how to do it to control the heart. So this is a, a change in a paradigm by understanding more about a biological system and therefore making it more possible to control it. The other thing I want to emphasize on this is I think this whole picture is changing the way we think of biological systems. In the old way, when we have a biological system like this, and what I've tried to represent here by the different shapes and different colors, is we have a system that has some stable function. And then it shifts to having a different state, and then shifts again. What we're used to thinking is that you're in some stable state, and then something forces you out of that, you wind up in a different stable state, and that forces you into another stable state. This sort of thinking is very extensive in biology, and even in some physical applications within biophysics. For example, uh, in terms of proteins, we're used to thinking of structure with multiple energy minima, and we must be at this energy minima, or one energy minima, and then we shift in conformation because we're going from one minima to another. And that's kind of similar to this one I'm picturing here. So this could be any state. This could be, for example, a state of a certain amount of blood pressure or um, a certain psychological state or um, a certain uh, function of the immune system um, or almost anything. And we're really used to thinking this way in biology. But what the chaos opens up is the possibility that being in a state doesn't mean that the state is stable, but that the act of being in that state eventually forces you into the other state. To emphasize this, in the Lorenz system, to go back to my barely drawn picture of the Lorenz system, you would think that rotating so let's say this represents clockwise rotation on this side, and this represents counterclockwise rotation in terms of the actual physical roles. So this is the phase space. And the physical space, uh, these correspond to clockwise or counterclockwise rotations of those roles of fluid. You would think that rotating in this direction is stable, and then eventually we switch to the other direction. That's not what happens here. What happens here, the act of rotating in this direction, as we said, because we're heated from below and cooled from the top, that the actual act of rotation mixes the fluid, changing the temperature gradient and causing the switch ultimately. So rotating in one part of the lobe causes you to switch to the other part say it in a technical mathematical sense. This system consists of three critical points, one here, one here, and one in the middle, and all three of them are saddles. So neither of these three points are a stable attractor. They're all unstable. So being in one place causes you to be in some place else. This is very different than this concept that we're used to thinking in medicine and biology uh, from the turn of the century called homeostasis. Which says that we're in some place and if we get kicked out, we always try to get back to the same place. What this says is that sometimes we have a system where the dynamics of the system keeps us in one place, but when it gets out or the motion in one place causes us to switch to something else from A to B. So this represents a different picture of maybe what's going on in biology. So, so to summarize this, the two insights that come out of chaos or not this sort of nonlinear dynamics are first of all that chaos or nonlinear systems can produce finer, faster control, which seems a little counterintuitive. The second idea is that maybe states in the body are never stable in the sense in which we're used to thinking of stability. And that being in one state, even though you may stay there for a long time, 
switches you to somewhere else. I mean, in a, in a superficial way, being alive leads to you dying, which in some sense is true because you wear out and you, you engage in activities that destroy the system. But it doesn't mean that this is necessarily bad or that this is unusual or something. Th to say this in a broader context, we don't know how to think about living things. me enlarge on this. Somehow we've been unable to learn from biology really how to think about what biology really is. So for example, the way we approach almost all the way we handle data from living things is we interpret the data in terms of machines that we build and therefore understand. And it's not even in terms of mathematics that we understand. I think this is really true. I think it's more in terms of machines and how we think of the world. So for example, when we build a machine, if we have one wire connected from A to B and then a different wire connected from B to C, when we look at the brain, we try to figure out each individual pair of connections. Or when we analyze the brain, we analyze one aspect of a cell at a time. And this is probably has nothing to do with how the brain works. The brain works by having lots of things going on at the same time. Okay? And somehow the mathematics and, and how we think of things is very difficult to handle this way. To me, the great advance of neural networks is that it allows us to think of multiple things going on at the same time, or how things are interconnected to each other, or how a system with different pieces is going to work. But by and large, we have been unable to look at the biology and see what the biology is telling us. And we're always interpreting the biology in terms of something else. And as I said, I think that interpretation is usually in terms of machines that we think we understand because we've, we've uh, uh, put them together. Um, and what the chaos does is at least gives us an other types of machines that we can think about in terms of what's going on, in terms of finer and faster control, in terms of maybe the state's not, not being stable. So it, it widens the perspective by which we can think about uh, biological things. So in summary, what chaos means is that we have a few independent variables. Um, but the behavior of those variables is so complex that it mimics random behavior. Yeah, a, uh, a dynamical, that a chaotic system is, determ is a dynamical system, which means it's deterministic, meaning that the values of the variables at the next instant in time can be calculated from their values at the previous instant in time, either from a difference equation if it's a map in discrete or from a differential equation if it's smooth. And we have this sensitivity to initial conditions that over the long run things are not predictable even though they're deterministic. This is very hard to understand because it's deterministic and yet over the long run we can't predict it because of the sensitivity to initial conditions. And in the phase space, we have an attractor that's low dimensional and is typically fractal. And that's how we tell that we're in a low dimensional chaos. These are some chaos references, which is uh, Gleick's book, which came out a number of years ago, called Chaos Making a New Science, which is a really nice um, non-technical introduction to this. And 
more technical introductions, I think a nice book is Francis Moon's book called Chaotic and Fractal Dynamics. Didn't used to have the word fractal in the title, but in the second edition now has the word fractal in the title. Um, so, and um, I like the first edition better of this because I think it's a little simpler. Um, even though the second edition has reproduced uh, two figures from papers that I wrote, and I think manages to spell my name either three or four different ways, I'm not sure. I, at least three. Um, so, and I like seeing my name in print, even if it's misspelled, so that's okay. Uh, but I still like the first edition better. And what Moon does, which I think is really nice, is that he gives really engineering examples. And so you see very clear examples, for example, in the um, containers of rockets uh, and in magnetically levitated trains um, and lots of other examples where there are very concrete applications of this in engineering. And two books that describe the real mathematics of fractals are this book with this wonderful title called Nonlinear Oscillations, Dynamical Systems, and Bifurcations of Vector Fields by John Guckenheimer and Paul Holmes. Uh, Guckenheimer was sort of the not the head, but the most senior person of the physicists who worked on chaos at Santa Cruz um, and has a very strong background in this area. And Paul Holmes is a more formally trained mathematician who's also worked in this area. They used to be at separate institutions. They're both now at Cornell in Ithaca. And uh, this is a yellow book since it's the mathematics version of this. It's not a green book like the biomathematics version, so it's yellow. It's from Springer. Um, and um, I can now say Springer because I say things like Wagner now. So, um, and another book which is, this is sort of more, it says 83, but it could have been 1950s. It's a very formal, old style, just in style mathematical approach. And very nice description of the Lorentz system and a number of other things. Uh, you have to get up to page about 280 before you get the definition of chaos, and their definition is something like it's a, um, uh, is it heteroclinic or homoclinic orbit? What's the definition of a chaos? I think it's a homoclinic orbit. Something like that. It's either one or the other. Um, ba basically means that the trajectories, in essence, don't, cr some aspects of the trajectories cross, so you can't predict where they're going to be. Um, uh, and a, a book written in a much more modern style, the way people currently write research articles, is by Ed Ott, uh, called Chaos and Dynamical Systems. And this has a nice description of control of chaos work that Ott and other people have been involved with, and just has more of the feel of the way people currently write research articles in this field. Um, and uh, a book that I used to own but has disappeared uh, by uh, 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 Holden called Chaos is a nice review in biology um, of a few years ago. And there's a nice book by Eric, at, Eric and Lisa Moskilda um, from Denmark called Complexity, Chaos, and Biological Evolution, which has a nice review of different examples of chaos in biology. For example, there's some work done by Donald Marsh on chaos in the um, kidney. There's also another article by me in here. Um, and so that lists a lot of nice things. Um, and that's just our book. I wanted to, to finish with, with this um, point. Um, these are basically a representation of the mathematical methods that we've used to approach the world, both in physics and now in biology, which is basically linear. And linear basically means we have systems with few pieces that interact weakly with each other, symbolized by this empty square. But um, the world isn't linear. The world is like this, and even more complicated than this. And there's really been a mismatch between the tools we have to analyze the data and the data. And as I'm sure I've said here, or I've certainly said in other classes, that my favorite quote is from the psychologist Abraham Maslow, who wrote that if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to treat everything as if it were a nail. And we've tried to get the world to fit into this framework, and it doesn't fit. And it means we've missed a lot of interesting parts about the world. And chaos and fractals are one of two nonlinear approaches 
Let, let me say this in a different way. I think just psychology and all of the statistics that I described at the beginning of this course has been based by looking at independent variables and then measuring their defects, effects on dependent variables and trying to correlate them in a linear way. This is what most of psychology is like. And then analyzing these linear correlations uh, with the assumption that there are small, large number of independent errors. This approach is basically not the way the world really is. The world is not linear in the sense that we can untangle the great thread of the universe and pull out separate segments of it. It just doesn't work that way. Things really are connected, and by trying to pull them apart, all we do is make it harder for us to figure out what the connections are. And the connections are not necessarily linear and not necessarily independent from each other. And I think what we're seeing are the development of tools in terms of fractals and chaos as an attempt to deal with these nonlinearities. Our ability to think of these systems, as I said before, is limited by these paradigms which I've described, by how we can think about things. And I've given in great detail two of these fractals and chaos. And what I'd like to do is to just try to give you a sense that there are many more paradigms that are nonlinear. And that I think what we're going to be doing over the next 100 to 500 to 1,000 years, so this means this won't be on the final, um, is really developing more properties of nonlinear systems and seeing what they are and then seeing if we see that in the biology. So I wanted to give a very brief overview of some other nonlinear systems that I haven't described uh, but which I think are going to be important. And one of them is called self-organizing criticality. And what this system consists of is a sand pile. And you can see someone from up there has been dropping sand on the sand pile. And you can see there at the beach there's an umbrella and there's a boat in the distance. And, uh, um, sand builds up the sand pile until it's too steep and there's an avalanche. And then the sand runs downhill. But what's interesting about this system is that it lives not at the point of stability, but of maximum instability. When the slope um, is too big, it, it is an avalanche and reduces to just being stable again. So it's always poised between being stable and unstable. And this actually produces fractals in the size of the avalanche, in the number of grains that fall down, and other properties. So systems like this that are poised between stability and instability, instability um, produce fractals. And it's called self-organizing because it all by itself it organizes to be at this unstable point because you keep adding sand until it's an avalanche and it relaxes just to where it's stable again. Critical means that it's like a phase transition. It's just at this critical point. And we're seeing a lot of this is a general model for, for earthquakes and forest fires and a number of other nonlinear uh, phenomena. Neural networks, which I haven't talked about here, another example of this which have many nodes. The nodes have values, like four, and the nodes are connected to each other. And some nodes are strongly connected. This node is connected by a value of eight, and others are weakly connected. This is connected by a value of one. And the new values of the node as the system involves in time depends on the values of the other nodes and the strengths of their connections. And again, this is a system that has a lot of pieces and a lot of nonlinear interactions. And is at least a starting point to think about how some brain things work. Now, does this mean that the brain works like these detailed mathematical properties of this neural network? And the answer is, I think, of course, no. But this means we have almost no ways to think about how complicated things with interacting pieces work. And this gives us at least one way to think about that. And these neural networks have properties that have interesting, uh, these neural networks have interesting properties. For example, if you have a large number of nodes and you cut out a few, the system still works, which is what goes on every time you drink alcohol. You lose a few more brain cells, but the system still largely works. OK, 
okay? And it has other properties that it can uh, find associative memory. That is, memories are stored not by their labels as they are in a computer, where what's in memory location three is what's next to memory location four, but you have association. So if you uh, try to think of a name of someone, you may picture their face first, and then that will lead to thinking of their name. So here, memories are stored by their meaning, and that's one of the things that this network can do. It can associate meanings with things. Another system is something called the cellular automata. In the cellular automata, each state in this one-dimensional automata, e each unit ha is in a state. In this case, there are three states, green, white, purple. And I don't know if that's the colors you have, but yeah, they are, surprisingly. We have the same colors this time. So these are the magic colors that are like invariant under. Uh, uh, I'm looking to see if you have the same colors in the same places that I have, but, uh, but you do. Um, the way this works is that at each time step in the calculation, each box, each unit, looks to a few adjacent units and depending on this, its state and the adjacent units decides what state it wants to be at the next time. So in this case, this one has changed states, but this one has stayed in the same state. And now in the next step, this one has changed states, and this one has changed states, and this one has stayed the same. This relatively simple model could actually do very complicated things. And it's interesting because these are like some of the interactions we have in biology with molecules or, or cells responding to the surface markers adhesion molecules and other cells, and the motions perhaps they do in an embryo. And very simple systems like this can compute and can do very complicated things. So this is another class of non-linear non systems. And the last class I want to give here an example of things called coupled maps. So here we have a bunch of chaotic systems represented by these little black squares, and they're all coupled to each other. So we form a grid of coupled systems, and again, this has properties that extend in three-dimensional space and in time as well to do things. So um, the point of this is we started, the point of this is that there's an overall paradigm, as I said, in psychology that we have things that we can basically separate out individual causes from individual measurements and that the cross connections between these two in some sense are weak. And that's not necessarily the case at all. And I would describe this as a linear system. And the hallmark of this analysis is that we can vary one independent variable, and that will affect one dependent variable. And that we're looking to analyze these things by using t-test or analysis of variance or similar things. And this is, I think, a very restricted picture of the world. What we've seen that this picture, which may be usefully represented by Gaussian statistics, is really a small spot of what the real possibilities are. And that we've then gone on in this class to discuss probability density functions, which are not Gaussian, and then situations first in fractals, where we have no means and variances which are even broader and then examples of chaos where we can get randomness or complexity without randomness to the examples I've given here which are further nonlinear systems for which the linear statistical analysis that everybody else but you but me told you about is not applicable So, so what I've been trying to do, I mean, in the whole semester here, is to develop not only the statistics that you've, some of you have had or you've all had to a different degree before, but also to try to place that in perspective in terms of their assumptions, which usually aren't made clear, and the types of data that they apply to, and try to give you a sense of what, what a bigger picture is in terms of types of properties that we see in real data and the types of mathematical approaches 
that are really appropriate, or perhaps a better word might be necessary. Oh, I can't stop spelling now. Two C's are necessary? No, but two S's? Yes. Yes. Is that? That are, that are necessary, maybe just necessary, that are necessary in order to handle things. And, and that's what I've been trying to do. And I've been trying to present the chaos in fractals, not in terms of chaos in fractals, because I'll do that uh, next spring, um, and maybe even sooner. Um, and all the time on the tapes, which exist on shelf number three in the left-hand side in my lab, um, unless they've been erased by aliens with magnetic beams. Um, so, so that's what I've been trying to do here, and, and to present things in a, a broader perspective in terms of what, what, what we've been doing in this class. So are there any questions on, on chaos or on broader perspectives of, of what we've been doing? Does anyone want to know what grade they're getting in the class? Well, every, everyone here who's been registered for the class has turned in all the homeworks in a satisfactory way. So that means that everybody who's done that gets an A for doing that. So that means that everybody's here who's registered for the class. And, and I've been pleased with what everyone has done, actually, in terms of the homework. So I've been very pleased. Um, Are you grading in a curve, too? Well, the curve is that <laughs> the curve is uh, that if you did okay, um, then you get an A. So that's a somewhat discontinuous curve. Right. But you're happy with that, presumably, right? No, of course. Okay. I was just making a joke. Okay. Uh, I was trying to make a joke, but not <coughs> successfully. Okay. Um, except I haven't gotten the sheets to fill in people's grades, but presumably that's waiting in one of my three ma mailboxes somewhere. Um, so I should be able to get that. Is so there any other? Uh, well, if you ask people if there are any other, there are never any other. But if, uh, I have to train people to interrupt. Maybe we should. I should do that next time. Um, we could have a little light that would go on that would encourage people to interrupt. But then, you know, some light would go on somewhere and they'd interrupt, and it would be very bad training. Then they'd only interrupt when the light would go on. So. Uh, so that's not going to work. So we're basically finished. I should uh, stop talking. <laughs>